Welcome to our time together this evening. Uh, we continue our study of the Psalms, various Psalms, um, but maybe some of the more well-known Psalms. And the one this evening is uh, very brief, but it's one of the most inspiring uh, of the Psalms that we have. And it's Psalm 8. Um, it's a Psalm of David. And I'd like to uh, read that at this point, to open with it. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is humankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild and the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This psalm seems to fit well with what we know of David as a young shepherd boy, uh, who no doubt out with his sheep, uh, tending them, taking care of them, protecting them, watching over them, uh, would be there would be many times when David is out and he looks up and he just sees the vast uh, uh, sky filled with stars. And I know many of us have done the same thing when we were children, uh, maybe lying down out in our yards on the grass, looking up and just seeing this wide open, uh, vast space filled with stars. Well, uh, David, as a young shepherd, is out uh, tending his sheep. Uh, at least this would be the background for that. The psalm begins with a very um, strong Hebrew way of looking at things, and that is to focus upon God. It begins with, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory fills the heavens. Here we find, uh, we may think it's repetition, but where it says, O oh Lord, our Lord, that sounds like needless repetition. But the first Lord, and if you would look in your, your Bibles, you would see that it's all capital letters. This first Lord is the term that is used for God's personal name. This is the name that he shared with Moses to tell the people uh, or to tell Moses who he was, but also to let the people know this is who I am. And uh, so what we have here is God giving his, uh, God using God, uh, David using God's personal name. And what it means then is that the God of all creation is the God of the Hebrew people, the God who has given his name to them or shared his name. God is not some two-bit local deity confined to a small geographical area. This was the thinking of the pagan cultures, that the gods and goddesses ruled over particular geographical areas. And David comes along and says, this Lord, this God, is the God of all creation. So it really is amazing. Then he goes on in verse 2 and says, you have taught children and infants. Well, let's look at it this way. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against their enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. It sounds a little bit uh, strange or odd or peculiar, but what basically though is being, say, being said is, God has an amazing way of uh, showing or teaching his greatness 
and he does it in a very unique way. God uses, sometimes God uses the weak things of the world to overcome his enemies. You have the judge Gideon. Gideon going up against a massive army of Midianites. Gideon begins with 32,000 men. The Midianites have 135,000. God ultimately tells Gideon, pare your army down. You've got too many. And he keeps doing that and doing it till finally he's down to 300 men. And Gideon no doubt thinks this is hopeless, but God is thinking you've got just the right number now. So that when you defeat the Midianites, you'll know it's not you. It's not your numbers. It's not the, the size of your military um, establishment. It's by my hand, says the Lord. Same thing we see with David. David, as a shepherd, use a shepherd boy, using the weapon of a shepherd, which was a sling with stones about the size of uh, tennis balls or baseballs, he uses that and he goes up against a well-trained fighting machine in Goliath the Philistine. Goliath, who has state-of-the-art armor on, comes up. And he's depending on his strength, his might, his skill, uh, with his sword and with his uh, javelin. David comes against him with the power and the spirit of God. And that's what David ultimately says. You come against me with power and might and skill and weaponry and all that. I come against you in the name of the Lord God that you have insulted. So an example of God using what appears to be the weaker thing to overcome his enemies. And then maybe the supreme example is Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, such a shameful, humiliating death that everything about it shouts failure, failure. And little did anyone know that the greatest victory of all time was taking place in what appeared to be the greatest example of humiliation and failure. Paul the Apostle states that principle of this psalm, that second verse, he states it this way. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. Um, our God is so great that he can and does often use the smallest, the weakest, the lowliest things and people to accomplish his purposes. Now, we move to verses three and four, and in this section, um, John Stott, in his book about uh, the Psalms, he titles this section, The Littleness of Human Beings. The Littleness of Human Beings. So, we listen to this beginning in the third verse. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, this first part now, David is contemplating the moon, the stars, the vastness, and what he comes to understand is, these are things that you have created, O God. These are the things that... that, that um, these are the work of your finger, your fingers. Uh, God is the master craftsman. Now, the reason this is important is in the pagan cultures, the moon and the stars and the sun were worshipped as deities. People bowed before them, uh, and uh, there were gods and goddesses. They were considered gods and goddesses. Well, what David wants to make clear is no, these things that you others bow down and worship, 
these are mere creations of the living God. This is how great he is. This is how powerful he is. So after saying that, then David says, what is humankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. When David looks at all of that, he is in awe that as large as it is, as vast as creation is, God, how is it that, that you even take mind of us? And then he goes a little further, not a little further, he goes a lot further, and he says, human beings that you care for them. So what we find here is that God not only takes note of human beings, but God cares for them. He knows them. And later we'll see he loves them so much that he sent his son into the world to die on a cross for our sins and the sins of the world. That's how much God loves the world. Yes, even those that are presently living in rebellion against him. That's his love is the reason he sent his son into the world. So then we look at this and um, the psalmist is simply taken aback at the vastness, the expanse of space, and then he's struck by how small we are, human beings, and how God takes note of us, but not only takes note of us, God cares for us and loves us. Now, beginning with verse 5 and moving forward, uh, John Stott says this talks about the greatness of human beings, the greatness of human beings. In 5, he said, You have made them little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. If you look at this in your translation or others, sometimes it may say you made them little lower than the angels or you made them little lower than heavenly beings. But also the word that's used there is Elohim, and it's the generic name for God. Uh, it's the term used for God in Genesis 1. Uh, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And so it's understandable that translators down through the ages would say, well, this is too shocking. I mean, we can't say that human beings are just a little lower than God. We better use that they are a little lower than the angels. But I believe that it, it absolutely is not only possible, but it is probable that it is supposed to be a little lower than God because this psalm reflects Genesis 1 and 2, and there God is at the center of that, and then God is going to create man and woman, and they're the only ones created in his image. So I don't think that this is by uh, happenstance. I think it's purposeful that God uh, wants us to know that we have been created in his image, and that is a unique place to be. In Genesis 1, we find out that we're the only ones created in the image of God. We are to be his image bearers. Sometimes in the ancient world, to denote um, the authority of the rule of the king in uh, out-of-the-way places or, or places where there was... Uh, uh, the king could not be there, then the king would have uh, either a figure of himself made and placed there or some type of figure, uh, uh, maybe a statue or something else. But it signified this belongs to this king and this is his image. Well, the Hebrews were forbidden to make images of God because God is too great to be contained in any kind of man-made image. But remember what God said to man and woman or, or, or teaches us there. Human beings are created in his image. So God says, you will be my image bearers. My image bearers are going to be living. 
image bearers. You're going to go and you're going to show others and you're going to tell others about who I am. It really is amazing uh, what a lofty uh, position um, human beings have been placed in. And then we move on to verses 6 through 8. You gave them charge, or you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all the flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Here, the thing is human beings have been placed in a unique uh, setting. They have been placed over the rest of creation. They are to have dominion over. They are to rule over. Now, let's understand this. Dominion uh, to rule over, it means to tend to, to take care of, um, to uh, care for things in such a way that not only do you have an opportunity to enjoy it, uh, creation, but others do too. Sometimes this was wrongly understood to be human beings have, have dominion over, they can dominate. And there have been times when uh, people have sought to uh, dominate creation, or another way we would say would be to exploit creation for whatever they could get out of it. This, that is not backed up in Genesis 1 and 2, and it's not backed up here. This is you are to rule over creation the way uh, I entrust it to you. And the way I'm entrusting it to you, I'm going to place you in the garden, and I want you to tend it, and I want you to take care of it, and I want you to till it, and I want you to do all the things that help it produce and to enrich your life, but also to enrich the lives of others. So there's no place in the teaching of Genesis 1 and 2 and Psalm 8 for abuse and misuse and exploitation of God's good creation. Now, having said all that, the psalmist concludes the same way that he started. And again, this is so, so perfect because life begins with God and life ends with God and we're in between. So the way he concludes it is this way. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God valued us so much that he entrusted creation to us to take care of. But later we see he transcended that as I shared with you earlier. He loves us so much that he sent his son into the world to die for our sins. And not only ours, but for the sins of the world. When Apollo 11 spacecraft journeyed to the moon in 1969, the leaders of the nations of the Earth were of Earth uh, were each invited to compose a message to be included on a small disk and left on the surface of the moon. Pope Paul VI, who was the political leader of the Vatican at that time, he sent along the text of Psalm 8. So imagine that. You're on the moon, you're looking out, and you see that small blue sphere that's known as planet Earth, and all around it you see um, the stars, the moon, and other uh, heavenly bodies and to know that the text of Psalm 8 was placed there on the moon. Could there be a more important and a more appropriate message sent and left on the moon than Psalm 8? I don't think so. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I look and see the moon and the stars, the work of your fingers, what are human beings that you even take note of them, that you 
care for them, you have made them a little lower than God, a little lower than yourself, Lord. Amazing. Psalm 8, a psalm of praise. Amen.